Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on APA style in a nutshell. And I have developed this um, lecture for students who come into my master's program in counseling and family therapy, and I assign them their first APA paper, and some of them go, oh no, I've never done APA style. You know, um, and so they're very worried about it. And yes, I can send them to some, you know, tell them to get the book. We have a wonderful librarian who teaches them about APA. Um, but it's also, I thought I would provide them with this a resource. And so this is a crash course in APA style to get you started. This is for like, you have a professor who signs you to write a basic five to 20 page pay paper in APA style. It's not a research proposal or a dissertation or a thesis or anything that's that co super complex. This is just the basic five to 20 page graduate school paper that needs to be in APA style. And I'm going to go through and try to hit some of the main points. So if you're trying to get started in a short amount of time, hopefully you'll find this lecture helpful. So I really think it's helpful to understand why APA style exists, why there's all this fuss, why professors and journal editors are so um, adamant about it, why it's important at all, why you should bother even learning it. First is, uh, it's good to know it's one of several recognized styles. Another very popular one is MLA or Chicago. And these are manuals of style that basically, you know, there's more than one way to, or want more than one theory of where a comma should go, where a period should go, what should be capitalized, what should not be capitalized. And these are various manuals that kind of, um, and that a group of, you know, community of scholars or authors have agreed on, this is, this is the system we're going to use. And the reason that we need these systems, the reason we need these manuals of styles is that it allows a community of scholars to really much more effectively and efficiently share their scholarship. And, and so what that means is, you know, if someone in, you know, conducts a study in Lab A and they want to report their findings, if they were able to just make up their own way of presenting everything and, you know, um, attributing uh, and citing other people, it would take, you know, the person in Lab B a very long time to understand what's going on because people in Lab B would decide on a totally different way of presenting their lab results. And it would be really impossible to... Um, to move science and knowledge forward in our culture. And, and so, because what happens now is that pr the people in Lab A and people in Lab B are using the same format to cite their results, to present their results. So when the people in Lab B are writing up their uh, study, they can compare with Lab B um, on, you know, in the literature review, how they're citing their numbers, everything is consistent. If they were allowed to just format things in their own way, it would just be chaos, basically. And so it's real important that it's really necessary for knowledge moving forward to have these consistent systems of style. There are also some real, um, so for several other benefits. A major one is, is an ethical, um, it allows us to ethically cite other people's work and give appropriate, um, what do you call it? appropriate um, recognition of where specific ideas are coming from. And so it allows each of us to double check another author's work or another researcher's work and to go back and read more. And so it allows us, without this um, proper citation of other people's work, it would be very hard again to move, to fairly represent our own work, represent the work of others, to distinguish who, what's mine, what's yours, so the whole intellectual property thing. Um, so there are many even legal and ethical issues that proper citation, that, that proper citation and this agreed upon um, system of style, it solves these problems for us. Practically, um, as someone who has probably graded nearly, I don't know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of papers in the last 20, uh, pages of papers in the last um, 20 years of being a professor, I, I can tell you when someone turns in a paper in proper APA format, they get the best part of my brain. They, I can see the big picture. I can follow the concept so easily. And all the formatting just fades into the background. It's actually a shorthand. I mean, APA style has all these shorthands to give information quickly. In comparison, when someone turns in a paper to me that is not in correct APA style, especially if there are lots of, you know, problems with it, I really can't get 
the, I, it's hard to distill the ideas out of it. It would take much more time on my part to do so. Um, and it's just not as clear. The ideas are generally not as clear, especially when we're going to talk about headings. Oh my God, they're like, they're just wonderful. I love APA headings. They make your writing and presentation of ideas so much clearer. So when someone can't use APA style well, it's just so much harder for the reader to make sense of what they're trying to say. And when you have someone like a professor or a journal editor or a book editor who are going through, you know, hundreds of pages, thousands of pages of manuscripts, having this make, it enables the reader to go through, an experienced reader, uh, such as an instructor or an editor, to go through the I mean, grade or um, evaluate a, a paper so much faster. It really speeds things up on the uh, other end. Um, and also, it's, it creates a community. There's this real shared language that is it's a shorthand that we all use. Um, and so it's really a mark of professionalism. And when someone, whether they're junior in the field or you know entering the field, junior or senior, if you can't use APA style well, it's kind of a, it's really in some ways disrespectful to the community. You haven't bothered to sit down, focus, and just learn a few minor details and use them consistently to use our shared language. And so it's really a mark of disrespect when you're not paying attention to these very important ways that we communicate through a very particular format in the field. So I hope one of these reasons inspires you to actually master this because it really is more important than I think most people entering the field recognize at the time. And I think the more you use it and if you, you know, get into the area of writing, um, journal articles or books, it becomes even more important to master these important skills. So let's start with some real basics. The first thing is everything's double spaced. So you can, even your tables and such, just put your, uh, you know, uh, word processing uh, software on double space everything. Um, but there's only one space after periods, commas, and semicolons. And so that is another thing to note. Um, the font should be something like Times New Roman and 12 point font definitely. You, you know, Times New Roman is what they recommend in the APA manual. There's also, uh, and, and you can use Garamond and, you know, depending on who you're writing for, they may have a preference. Most publishing houses do prefer Times New Roman and definitely 12 point font. Don't mess with that 12 point. You um, certainly would not want to put a, um, you would not want to put any paper in what they call a sans serif font, like this font I have here on the PowerPoint, uh, things like Arial, um, that do not, serifs are those little, um, those little hooks at the end of the letters. Those are made for reading uh, long narrative documents. Uh, PowerPoints are better done in Arial and these sans serifs without the hooks. So um, margins are at least one inch on all sides and your instructor may have other, um, I actually require my students to do 1.5 because um, I do still like to write in the margins of papers um, with certain papers and if I'm going to hand grid the papers by hand rather than digitally I do ask for one and a half and that's allowable. Um, but that's just because the one and a half was the old standard because generally people wrote in the margins, but now a lot of people, you can also do uh, digital comments, and for that you really just need the one inch margin. All your language will be very formal. Um, you'll not be using contractions or slang, so you don't say don't, can't, you write out the word do not, cannot. In terms of numbers, you will write out all numbers below 10 and use the numerals of for 10 and above. And However, every any time a number actually represents something that you're measuring, something statistical or mathematical or date, a time, an age, you can use the no, the numeral, um, like you would say five milliliters of something, and you would not write out the word five. You'd use the numeral. However, um, if you're going to start a sentence to say fifty percent of all blah blah blah, you would write out the word fifty because any numbers that start a sentence, you need to write those numbers out. The APA cover sheet is a very formal, very consistent, very high, highly detailed document that um, a lot of people who are new, this is one of the places they're like, well, I'll just put whatever I want on that thing. I'm going to just add here and there to it. So let's go over what the APA cover sheet includes. The first thing it has is something called a running head. This is a shortened title. It's no more than 50 characters. And the purpose is if anyone is to drop the manuscript on the floor and it's not stapled, you can put it all back together. So that's the purpose of a running head. Um, 
It is left justified, and on the first page, you're going to write out running head, colon, and then in all caps, you're going to put whatever that shortened title is. But after the title page, so you're going to need to click, if you use Word, there's a little button to click to say there's a different, um, different first page running head. Um, then the running head is just shortened to just the titles. You don't write out the word running head on every page. Um, then you have the page number, which is right justified on the same line as the running head. Then in the middle center of the paper, in title case, you write the title of the paper. On the next line, just single, you're going to do a double spaced. Don't add extra lines, just double space. Next line is the name of the author. Again, it's centered under, under the title of the um, paper. Next line, this is double space, is the university or professional affiliation, and that's centered on the, the line below the author's name. That's what's on a cover sheet. Unless you get permission from an instructor or a journal editor, you generally do not put anything else on, like the name of the class, um, the name of the professor, the semester. Some of my students just add all this random stuff. I'm like, no, this is, this is what goes on it. When you are submitting for a formal journal, typically you'll, um, the journal will specify, you know, usually it's your contact information, um, would go on a, on a line and they will tell you at the back, you know, when you're submitting the journal and the instructions, they tell you exactly how to do it. And so this is what a APA cover sheet is. You don't change it unless you get formal instructions to do otherwise. So here is a sample of a cover head from a paper I submitted once. It's, you can see it says running head colon, capital letters is my short title, Mental Health Recovery Part 1. And that's left justified on the same line we have the page number. And then um, here you can see the title, uh, the two line titles, nice and long. Then I have my name on the next line, this is all double spaced, and then I have my university affiliation on the next line. And that's all that goes on that title page. And it's a little tricky, um, like I said, because on the next page you're not going to have the word running head, so you just need to work with Word and let it know that there's going to be a different running head for the first page. And there's actually a function. Uh, if you're using Word, it's under View, um, Head Air, Footer, and in that you can put this in. I, I have had students who actually have typed this in, God bless them, on every single page. It's very painful. There's a wonderful function in Word that takes care of this for you. Uh, formal APA papers, especially when you're submitting for a journal article, uh, include an abstract. Most typical academic papers do not. If your professor asks for it, you can go ahead and do that. Basically, the abstract's always on the second page. It has a heading that's titled. It's a first level heading. We'll get into that in just a minute. You don't need to indent. It's one of the only paragraphs you don't indent um, for your abstract. But it would always be the second page if it's required in the paper that you're writing. So here we have a sample of how this would look formatted. You can see um, how the running head has changed. We deleted the word running head, um, but, but that you have the running head there in the page number. Abstract is centered, and then it goes into the, abs uh, the actual text of the abstract. It is the only paragraph that is not indented. So in terms of structuring the body of the paper, um, APA papers are structured with headings. And once you learn to use these, you are going to love them. I can hardly write anything anymore without my headings. I just love it. It is the outline of the paper. It's very clear. Um, it typically, in most papers uh, that are 5 to 20 pages long, you won't need more than three. They do have list up to five in the APA manual when you're writing a thesis or a dissertation. Is typically, or a book is when you would use um, more of those levels. But you never know. Um, but all ideas... Um, we, we, you know, so this is the outline of the paper, and so anything that you present should fit into a heading. And when you have a heading, you only want to put things a into that uh, section that relate to the heading and nothing else. So if you have a section heading on gender, okay, you put everything related to gender in that section. You don't randomly go talk about it later in a multicultural, you know, heading or a theory section. So, and if you find that you have, um, you do end up talking about wanting to talk about gender in a lot of strange ways throughout the paper, that means your heading structure is not working for you, okay? And so that may mean you need to sit back, look at um, what you're writing, and restructure your paper. 
So these headings are just a godsend because they force you to clearly think about what you're writing, organize your paper, organize the concepts. And so you really want to have, um, if you're diligent and disciplined where here's a heading, I only have stuff related directly to that heading in this section, it, um, it really will help you organize your thoughts. And if you're finding that, you know, different, the same topics popping up in multiple little headings, then you probably need to sit back and reorganize. So, but this is basically the outline. Um, of your paper and it really reduces the need for tons of transitions. It makes it easier for the reader to follow your ideas and quite frankly it forces you to think about what you're writing and organize your ideas yourself. And so when the headings aren't working you, you know that you need to go back and rework your um, outline and your structure. So first level headings are always bold, centered, and in title case. Title case is when all the major words are capitalized. Um, level two is bold, left justified, and also in title case. And then third level heading is bold, indented, uh, sentence case. And then the text of that paragraph is going to begin right after the period. So again, once you learn to use headings, you will just love them. And they make your life, writing, and thinking so much easier. Um, and so Again, you can look at the APA manual uh, for other, you know, for the examples, look at APA papers, you can look at any journal article, any book in the field, all has these heading levels. And once you get the hang of it, it just makes your life easy. So I want to spend a moment just talking about the voice of the author in APA style. First of all, in APA papers, most typically, um, most typically there's some kind of review or discussion of the literature. And so you do not make, the author cannot make any claims or statements without grounding it in the literature. So your opinion really should not be in an APA style paper. You need to go and find a citation for it or you don't mention it. Um, if you are a researcher, so you, you're, and you're presenting your own research, this, and this lecture is not about presenting your own research, then you don't need a citation, but it's very clear from all the other formalities of APA style that this is your research, this is your piece that you're contributing to the literature, so there's no um, citation for it. But otherwise, m when you're doing your basic lit review um, for a in APA style, you will need to cite all of your claims and quote-unquote facts and avoid opinion. And generally, you will avoid the term I or we. Some, there are some exceptions to this, and that's often when you're doing the research study and needing to describe what you do in active voice. There are some postmodern, um, if you're, you're doing a postmodern type paper, sometimes you will also use first uh, person. And again, there's a very specific way to do that within that tradition. In general, you will use very formal language and concise language. You will not be using flowery, metaphorical, or even emotionally charged language. It's generally not APA style. It's a scientific language. So the idea is to present what's known in the literature um, with a lot, without infusing your opinion into it. And so generally, it has a, it's, I always say if it's dry and boring, you're close to APA style. Um, but it's clear, it's formal, it's concise, and it is a, um, a concise, and it is a more formal scientific style. It's very important to understand in-text citations. So in-text citations are used when you're referring to an idea developed by somebody else or facts or statistics from somebody else, you need to cite it. And in APA style, um, in-text citations are done with the author's last name and the year. And typically, um, we paraphrase what another author is saying or refer to a key concept that a person developed. And generally for these, you will not need a page number, although it is allowable in APA style, but typically it is not. The page numbers are done for direct quotes. So there are two basic formats for in-text citations. One is parenthetical, so then this would typically go at the end of the sentence. It can go within a sentence right after, like the key term, sometimes you do it. Um, but typically you would, you know, paraphrase a claim and then put the author in the year at the end. So the example I have here is, you know, Gayhart 2014. And then you would go to the reference list to find out what is Gayhart 2014, you know, and where to go find that original resource. And so when you're writing an APA style, most every um, paragraph um, 
will have several citations in it. One thing you do not, what, one thing you do do in APA style, the first time you refer to a concept from someone else, you cite it in the first time it's mentioned. You don't put it, you don't go describing someone's research for six sentences in a paragraph and then at the end plop in the in-text citation. You know, when you, um, when you make your first claim, that's the time that you put their name in, the first time you refer to the concept, not at the end of a paragraph. Now you can sometimes um, actually put the author in as a subject or an object of a sentence. So in that case, you would put the, the last name into the sentence and put the in parentheses the year. And that again is another alternative way to do the in-text citation. Uh, when you want to, you know, refer specifically to the author, you know, and make them the verb, or I mean, the, the, you know, the, you know, um, the object or the subject of the sentence. And you should notice this in all the reading you're doing uh, related to the field. You will see these this form of citation used over and over again. So one of the other common errors or misunderstandings in APA style is understanding and versus the ampersand and when to use which. Basically, when you have two or more authors, you will need to use wor the word and or ampersand. So when it's parenthetical, so when you ref you're doing the citation in parentheses, you can use an ampersand because we would never put an ampersand in a sentence in English, right? So we don't put it into the sentence. So when it's in a sentence, you, you write out the word and. Again, it's formal. And the only time you can use that ampersand is uh, in the reference list and uh, for parenthetical in-text citations. And you can see the examples here. Gayhart and McCollum in parentheses, you use the ampersand. Gayhart and McCollum found blah, blah, blah. That's when you would um, write out the word and. So when citing multiple authors, this is always a lot of fun for in-text citations. So when it's two authors, it's easy. You will cite both authors' names every single time. But when it's three to five authors, the first time you cite uh, the reference, you will list all five of the last names only, no initials. And after that, you will do um, just the first author and et al. And so it's the, um, uh, so how that looks is the first author's last name, no comma, then et, then all, then period, then comma. And that's how it goes every single time, then space in the year. So um, whether it's in text or parenthetical, for three to five authors, the second time it's cited, um, you will use et al. And there's always a good joke that et al is the most published author in the history of psychology. Now, if there's six or more authors, you just do the first author and et al every single time, because after six, we've um, lost count. And remember, no initials go, or first names, go into the in-text citations. So direct quotes are often the bane of existence of thesis and dissertation students who have 50 to 100 references, and they've done direct quotes, and they forgot to do the essential element, which is to always cite the page number when you have a direct quote. In general, you should really keep your direct quotes to a minimum and just where needed. Um, but you do need that page number. So when you're doing a short quote, something under 40 words, you're going to just have maybe a short sentence or a very brilliant phrase. And notice that even if that phrase ends in a period, you do not put a period there. Instead, you put the parentheses, the author's last name, comma, year, comma, P for page, P period for page, and then you put the page. If it was actually on two pages, it spilled over, you would put, you know, PP for two pages period, then 141 hyphen or dash 142. So, and the period goes at the end, right after the parentheses. That's where the period goes for a short quote. In contrast, for long quotes, 40 or more words, you're going to introduce it. You're going to then have to do a indent blocked paragraph. See how there's a, it's a um, the entire text of the long quote is, it's an indented paragraph. And then you're going to put in this really amazing thing that cannot otherwise be said. It could not be paraphrased in any other way. The reader really has to read everything this amazing person has said. You're going to put that all the, the direct quote in. And then you are going to put a period for that long quote. And then you're going to put the page number or page numbers and no period there. 
So, and generally you have introduced the author in the year above. If not, you would, if not, you would put the author in the year in that parentheses, but again, with no period after it. So this is the format for long and short quotes. It's a little bit detailed oriented, but you want to get that right and get it consistent and make sure you get those page numbers for those direct quotes. Cause it is often the most painful piece when someone thinks they're nearly done with their thesis or dissertation. So every paper has a reference list because you're not talking about your own ideas generally in APA style. Or if you're developing your ideas, you're, 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 you're showing where they fit in with the rest of the literature. So there always should be a reference list. Um, this is a list at the end of the paper. Um, it starts on a separate page. It's got a first level heading called references and they're done with hanging indents in uh, the sixth edition. The fifth edition went back, went, um, did regular indents, the third edition or fourth edition had hanging indents and I like the hanging indents. I'm glad we're back to them. Um, and they're always done, of course, in alphabetical order. And there's a lot of detail in the APA style about how to organize these, about all the different variations. Here I'm going to talk about the main types of references that most people should be using for their average academic paper. Um, because you're going to really focus on journal articles, professional books, academic books, chapters from edited academic books, and maybe government websites for statistics. And yes, they have ways to cite, you know, videos, um, you know, magazine articles, but when you're writing a formal APA paper, you're typically gonna focus on books, chapters from academic books, journal articles, government web pages, not just random web pages where you're pulling some stats off of those. You always wanna go to government or official World Health Organization, you know, formal websites of major entities um, that would be considered useful in, by the scientific community, basically. So I'm just going to hit um, examples of these and then I refer you to the APA manual for all the many, many fine distinctions, but I'm going to hit, hit the highlights of the major ones that you should be using most of the time when writing your average uh, academic paper. And yes, I use my work for most of these examples because I uh, don't want to offend anyone else by doing that or have any other uh, implications by citing other works. So anyway, so for, re for book references, um, these are really pretty straightforward. You're going to have the author's uh, last name, comma, first initial. And if there's more than one author, you can put a comma, an ampersand, and then the other author. Uh, you'll have the title of the book. And I want you to listen to this really carefully because this is where new people get really confused. In an APA reference list, the title of the book is not in traditional title case. You only capitalize the first letter of the title and the first letter if there's a semicolon uh, after the semicolon. That's it. Otherwise, you do not capitalize and proper names and nouns. Um, so you can see here with this book I edited actually with Harleen Anderson, it's collaborative therapy, therapy is lowercase, colon. You get a capital R for relationships and conversations that make a difference. And the title is italicized and they're only capitalized the first letter of the title, the first letter, the rest is in lowercase letters. Please focus on this. And then you would put the um, place of publication colon the name of the publisher. And you're usually allowed to, um, you can usually drop the word press off. So anyway, this is how you do the uh, reference. Um, make sure you only have initials for the author. And if it is an edited book, you would put either ed for a single editor or eds after the authors, and it's a capital ED. And later on, you'll notice that edition has a lowercase ed. Again, subtle differences that have a lot of meaning uh, in APA style. So books, main thing to remember is uh, the title. It's not in formal title case, it's in this what's called sentence case. Now, book chapters seem to cause a lot of confusion for many of my students, so I'm gonna take a moment here. So, first of all, you will notice the person that you list as the primary author, which you can alphabetize it under, is the 
author of the chapter. They're the ones that had the bright ideas, not the editor of the book, okay? So you always cite the person who is listed as the author of the chapter if it's an edited book with different authors for each chapter. Always the author of the chapter. So you put their name just like you would do for the book, the year. The year is the publication of the year of the book. Then you're going to put the title of the chapter, non-italicized, again, just in that uh, sentence case. First word of the chapter title and the first word after the colon. So here, we, here the title of our chapter was Inviting Therapeutic Presence, colon, and Mindfulness-Based Approach. Then you're going to write in, and then you put, this is the only time you do not put the initials last, S. Hinks and Tom Bien, Ed's mindfulness in the healing relationship and then you put the page numbers of that chapter and it's New York again Guilford again here you can see it um, the author of the chapter the name of the chapter and then you put in the name of the editors and the name then you put the name of the book and again you do not capitalize it um, like you would a normal book title and then the name of the year you do need those page numbers again here so please make you want to make a note of that it's a little bit more involved because there are two layers of authors, um, but this is an important one to get right. Probably the most frequent reference you'll use is a journal article. And for these are thankfully pretty straightforward. You start with the author's uh, last name and first initial again, year. Then the title of the article, which as you can see is not italicized. And again, it's in the basic sentence case, only the capital first letter and capitalized after the colon. And then you do the journal. And the journal title is the only type of title that is actually capitalized like a normal title that you learn to do in, you know, elementary school or high school. So the journals get the capital letters that are typical of the titles of the major words in, in it. The journal title is also italicized, as is the journal volume. Now, often there is an issue number. Um, but if the, now this is a little bit tricky in the detail, you don't actually need the issue number if each volume is numbered from page one to 600, like most journal are, are in, most journals will have, you know, four to six issues per year. And typically they just number from one to 600. Sometimes they will start renumbering each issue. So if each issue starts with the number one, then you would need to put the issue and the issue would be in parentheses and it would not be italicized. If you don't know, put the issue in. If you do know, and typically when you see, you know, I know that this journal rarely has 400 pages in a single journal, so I can be pretty sure that this is, you know, I could drop the issue number on this one. And then you put the DOI number. And this is the digital object um, identifying number and it, you, you put that whole long string of numbers in without a period at the end. So this is how the basic journal article reference uh, looks, and you can obviously get, there are 100 variations of these that you can find um, in the APA manual itself. But again, um, you want to remember that you capitalize the journal article, but not the, 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 not the journal, the article does not get it does not get the normal capitalization, but the journal, the name of the journal does, and that's really the only thing, pretty much, in most of the APA, with very few exceptions, that would be capitalized in a typical t title case. The last type of reference I'm going to talk about here is the website reference. And again, you don't want too many of these, and you pretty much want them um, only to major, widely recognized, typically government-type sites. Um, but basically, again, you're going to do the author and the first initial, the date, and then the title of the document. Again, not in your typical title, title case. And then you put retrieve from and the URL. And so here you see an example of an article um, from the National Institutes of Mental Health, um, which would be the major depression among adults, retrieve from, and then you have the nice long um, URL for that specific one. So the best place to actually get the formats for this is on the APA website for the uh, Manual of Style. It's the best place to get the examples for how to do the website references. So finally, I just want to point you um, to some resources, the first of which, of course, is the APA Manual itself. 
and you there are paperback hardback editions and it's really important to actually own one and use one it, it there's nothing that really compares to it the one thing I want to say if you're buying a used version of the APA manual um, for this sixth edition uh, the very first round of printing had several errors in it so you want to avoid getting a first print edition of the sixth edition because um, it will it will have some errors in the sample pages primarily that it, the examples that it gives you are wrong minor things but they are wrong so where you find that is when you open it up on the page where you would find all the publisher information and the uh, data publication they will uh, list it if you know if you're seeing second print then you've got the uh, second round of printing where they fix some of those errors so you definitely want your own copy of it there is an apastyle.org website um, that goes through some of the, uh, the details and and gives you more information like I said especially about the websites if, you're, if you've got a site a website this APA style is a very useful site um, Purdue also has a wonderful website that goes through and step-by-step kind of teaches you more in detail about the APA style also. So these are some good ref uh, resources. And again, it is it is important to master APA style. And I hopefully this has been a useful introduction to kind of get you started with some of the main things you need to know when you're writing your first papers in grad school. Obviously, if you're doing a thesis and dissertation, you will need to go a lot more in depth than this workshop went. But hopefully I kind of demissed it demystified APA style. Hopefully you see a little more of the purpose and got some of the key features. And in the end, I hope this lecture helps you enjoy writing your next APA style paper. Best of luck.